Psych Sessions podcast is sponsored by STP. That's the Society for the Teaching of Psychology. Please visit teachpsych.org to become a member at only $25 per year for so many teaching-related materials and so much more, including awards and resources. Just a couple of things to announce this week. Register for APA 2020 Virtual at convention.apa.org. $50 for APA members, $15 for APA graduate affiliates and APA high school affiliates, and $75 for non-APA members. A list of STP's Division II programming at APA 2020 is available at teachpsych.org under the conferences link. And due to the continued uncertainties caused by the pandemic, the annual conference on teaching will be held virtually in October. Please visit teachpsych.org and check under the conferences tab for further information. Hello, and welcome to Psych Sessions, conversations about teaching and stuff. I'm Eric Landrum, along with Garth Neufeld, your podcast hosts. As the name implies, we center on conversations about teaching, but we often veer into other interesting topics, which is the end stuff. This is episode number 97, where Garth had the opportunity to interview Stephen Brookfield from the University of St. Thomas Emeritus in St. Paul, Minnesota. Before you hear the interview, please allow me to share some listening tips and some of my favorite moments. I'm really appreciative that Garth and Stephen took the time to sit down and and have this chat together for psych sessions. Um, Stephen is what I would call an expert in uh, anti-racism and teaching undergraduates. He has a book out called Teaching Race, How to Help Students Unmask and Challenge Racism. And he's currently co-authoring a text to come out in 2021 called Creating an Anti-Racist White Identity. And so um, Stephen has, uh, I would say, 15 to 20 years of practice, not only developing the expertise in this area, but then also uh, developing exercises and um, activities to implement with students because um, the real expertise that he shared is that he's had so many difficult dialogues. He, he He knows how to do this type of work. And what I really appreciated is because I'm not only starting, to be honest with you, really not only starting in earnest to do anti-racism work in my own personal life, but I also want to implement that in many of my classes. And so it was just really instrumental, and I so much appreciate the time that Garth and Steven spent together uh, for this interview. One of the um, catalyzing events that they talked about, obviously, was the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis in 2020. And um, the interesting aspect of this from a researcher's perspective is that, you know, why was this event so powerful when there's been, you know, murders of black African-American individuals for centuries? And, you know, from Stephen's perspective, a lot of that has to do with what he called digital storytelling and, and the power of the narrative that comes out of Minneapolis. And so... Um, they talk about that a little bit in his research with videography and the power of that modality. Uh, other comments that you know that really struck with me, um, they had a really interesting conversation about the notion of allies and, and what that means. And I'm just gonna tease you with that. I don't I don't want to give that away. Um, I want want you to hear that unfold as it did for me. I, I really appreciated the honesty and, and the forthrightness that Stephen talks about how difficult this work is to do. Um, I, I think it encourages me personally a bit because I, I know how difficult experts say it will be. So when it's difficult for me, I'll be okay because it's difficult for everybody. For example, he said at one point, and this is, I'm sure it's not an exact quote, it's a paraphrase. He says, uh, there are two ways to do anti-racist work, uh, badly or not at all. But I, I, I think I will aspire to do it badly because I think I've come to a point in my life where I just think it's really important to do and to, to engage my students in these difficult conversations to, to challenge our beliefs together and, and to be better human beings. 
there was a little bit of a discussion about microaggressions, although not really too much. Um, as I look over my notes from uh, listening and enjoying this podcast, and he talks about the deep emotions that are going to happen. And he offered a really interesting tip about if you're doing this type of work in a workshop setting, or I think this could work in a classroom as well. He mentioned a, um, a, a website called uh, backchannelchat.com that he uses when he's doing this type of work where people can anonymously give feedback to the presenter. So if something was going wrong in a group or there was, you know, something going right or something that, you know, people wanted to report, but anonymously, I thought that was a really great tip that he offered. Very generous of him to do that. They talked very seriously about how race is a systems problem. It's an institutional problem for colleges and universities and, and mentioned the term, uh, I'm sorry, repressive tolerance and talked about that and and how it develops. And so it was really interesting because, you know, obviously Stephen has been an academic for much of his life and Garth has as well. They had, they were able to have a very learned conversation about racism in higher education and and really talked about a, a common theme throughout is the role of white supremacy in racism. And so it was good to get that, the take of an expert and, you know, how do you describe it? How do you define it? And the definitions what I'm learning from my own study are so vitally important uh, and other authors are stressing this as well. It's, I just really appreciated that. They they ended towards the end of the conversation about talking about brave spaces in addition to the terminology you hear sometimes about safe spaces. And so, again, I, I think it's this is invaluable, not only for, I think, for instructors who are thinking about their own personal journey like I am, but also for instructors who are thinking about how do you implement and, and bring these things into your classrooms so that you can help students, you know, think about these issues as they're going out into the workplace or to graduate school and then into a workplace. So I hope you enjoy this very important episode. Hi, everyone. I want to follow up Eric's introduction uh, on this episode with Stephen Brookfield and just talk a little bit about my experience doing this. Uh, I think that I was pretty straightforward in this interview when I said that I feel ill-equipped to uh, discuss race uh, as a white man in higher education. I feel ill-equipped to do it uh, in the classroom. Uh, I'm very careful in these conversations about race in my personal life. Uh, I allude to in this episode that I'm, I'm uh, the fact that I'm glad that I have my wife, who is so well-read in this area, to run things by. But um, just personally, it was a very nice conversation uh, where I got to uh, learn from somebody who's been at this for a while. I guess I, I feel very fortunate to have been able to do that. So in this episode, I, as it was happening, I was realizing how, uh, how white-centric uh, this episode was from my perspective. And um, Stephen helped me to, uh, to not only just understand that as I listen back on the episode, but to also embrace the fact that this work is a struggle, and it's an imperfect struggle, and it's about progressing, um, and uh, it's about owning uh, our imperfect work. And so uh, I love a quote that he gives at some point in this um, in this interview, uh, or um, maybe I'll get it wrong here, but it was it's that there is there is not doing the work and then there's doing the work wrongly. And those are kind of the two options. And um, and so uh, I will continue to do the work of anti-racism, of acknowledging uh, white supremacy in uh, in institutions and systems uh, as imperfectly as I can, as humbly as I can and, and moving forward when somebody like Stephen Brookfield um emails you back and says, yeah, I'd love to talk to teachers about something like this. It just really is a testimony to them. I think you'll hear in this episode that Stephen really loves what he does and he's an activist and he really wants to see these systems change and that's why he's involved. So when somebody like that uh, is willing uh, to have a conversation, especially right now when his time is uh, in such demand because what he's written in the work that he's done is so relevant to what we're going through. I really appreciate it. And I, I view it as, uh, as it's kind of his love for this issue and, um, his, uh, desire to see higher education change that he would come on and talk to us about this. So anyway, uh, to Steven, thank you very much for sitting down with me and for the rest of you, 
I hope that this is really helpful as you are trying to figure this out in your classroom and uh, in your personal life as well. Thanks. I'm here with Stephen Brookfield, and it is Stephen, right? It is Stephen, indeed. <laughs> okay, fantastic. That would be a bad way to start things out. But um, and uh, Stephen is at the University of Saint Thomas. Uh, now, are you still a full-time faculty member there? I know you do a lot of traveling, a lot of speaking. I actually am uh, emeritus professor. Okay, there, yeah. And I'm also uh, adjunct faculty at Teachers College, where I worked for uh, 10 years in the 80s, early 90s. And um, in September, I'm joining Antioch University uh, as a, a distinguished scholar. Fantastic. And um, so you are uh, not slowing down. It sounds like you're, it looks like you're still pumping out a lot of books as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I was put on the planet to write and uh, both uh, books and also fiction and music. So um, I thought I'd be retiring to, to spend all the time with my band. But now with COVID, we can't rehearse and we can't play. Um, there's no gigs. So, uh, so yeah, I, I have a book coming out. Um, I'm finishing up right now, uh, called creating an anti-racist white identity. That's taken up a lot of my effort the last 10, 20 years. Um, that will be out in early 21 with stylus, uh, publishers. Well, we will look forward to it, uh, certainly. Um, let me just tell you a, a little bit about how I uh, came across your work, um, because we've never met each other before this. And, uh, and, and so, again, so grateful that you uh, are taking the time. But uh, I have some colleagues at Cascadia College in Seattle who um, did a faculty learning circle um, around uh, becoming a critically reflective teacher and absolutely raved about that book, which is now in its second edition. Um, and so I, I told them I would pass that along to you. My, uh, my co-chair of the Teaching and Learning Academy, uh, her name is Ane Tuwonaman, uh, really deserves the connection here. So anyway, I wanted to pass that along that they really enjoyed your book. Well, thank you. That's wonderful. Um, and tell them that if they ever do something like that again, I'm always happy just to do a zoom in and, and talk about the book because it's, you know, it's very interesting for me to find out how people are using um, my work. I'm sure it is for you too. You write something and you've no idea when it goes out, you know, who it will reach or what effect it will have. So um, I really enjoy talking with people who are, are using my things uh, in some way. So thank you for passing that along. God, of course. I appreciate of, that. Of course. And and it's something that I've actually heard you mention twice now, and I picked up in at the beginning of your book on teaching race, is that uh, there are different reasons why we do certain things, especially professionally in our lives. Um, I know for myself, sometimes it is uh, there are social aspects uh, of just being with people who uh, speak my language, who are doing the same things. And um, and then there are there are some things that we feel called to, and I think that the what you said at the beginning of uh, teaching race is that something like they're they're torn out of your out of your heart. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Where where does that come from for you? Um, you know, just just being in the world and seeing what's happening around me, and uh, of course. The teaching race book and the current one, uh, most of that work has been done before the George Floyd um, murder here in, in Minneapolis. And I kind of wish I could go back now and just do them all from start again. But um, I, I think it was, um, I don't know, sometime in the 90s, um, uh, kind of early 90s, uh, someone asked me, um, a couple of things happened. Some, someone said, you know, why is your work race blind? And the idea of being race blind really hit home. That was a white colleague. That was a very grateful to her for raising that. And then another um, African-American colleague says, you have to understand that we see everything through the lens of race. Everything 
in the world we experience through the lens of race. There is nothing that is race free. So I don't know, 30, 20, 30 years ago, how 90s, uh, I guess that's almost 30 years ago. Um, I started thinking about all this and then I had the fortune to work in Chicago a lot with some, um, colleagues of color. And, um, it just seemed to me like race was the, uh, as Du Bois said so long ago, it's, it's the, the kind of unacknowledged problem that, um, people ensnared in white supremacy just don't see. And I thought, you know, this is, this is such a big issue that I need to now really spend a lot of time understanding it. And I'm not going to write anything or talk about it until I've, you know, looked at this for at least 10 or 15 years. Um, so I did that. And, and, um, and then I, I guess I started writing about this stuff in the mid 2000s, 2003, I think somewhere, somewhere like that. So I guess I looked around it for about 10 years and then, um, thought, okay, I feel like I have something to say on it. And what I realized was that most discussions of race are framed around diversity and equity and inclusion. And that involves broadening um, experiences out. So particularly in a predominantly white institution, the white faculty, administrators, staff, students, and so on, are made aware of the benefits of diversity, the, the benefits of difference. And it seemed to me that a lot of that work was not focusing enough on white supremacy and racism. Um, and white supremacy is the ideology that legitimizes racism. So my background um, has, has part of it has been heavily into critical theory. And critical theory is always looking at how dominant ideologies frame how people think and act. And it seemed to me that white supremacy as a dominant ideology was the thing I really had to understand. And so as a white person, that was my um, particular role, you know, because I cannot understand how racism is experienced as a person of color. That's impossible for me, no matter how much I talk or hear testimony or, or read um, with colleagues and friends. You know, I can never understand that, but I can understand how white supremacy is learned because um, my interest is in adult learning and how it's transmitted um, in informally uh, and uh, almost covertly and, uh, and how it's perpetuated without people realizing it. So that kind of became the focus of my interest was on, uh, you know, what whiteness is and, and white identity and, and the, the formative influence of white supremacy and, so that's, that's where I've been really, Garth, the last uh, decade, I guess, um, in, in my interest and, and, and writing, put out a lot of stuff on that recently. Well, first of all, there, there are some really interesting things about, uh, about your current situation, uh, being that you've lived in uh, Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul area for, uh, for quite a while. And yeah. then uh, the murder of George Floyd happens at your doorstep. And um, I, I understand how, uh, how it would be nice to be able to go back and probably revisit things because you've got some perspective, uh, some different perspective now, and maybe some things have gotten clear. What would you say that you have, learned and i know this is such a large conversation but what are the things that stick out to you that you might have addressed differently in the way that you uh, thought about this work or did this work for the last 15 years in light of the um recent events which you know which have caught fire although we know that these events have happened these kinds of events have happened for a long long time right right so i think my uh analysis of how white supremacy works um, would, would probably stay pretty much the same. What I would be most interested in is the resistance and the opposition that this, um, this event uh, instigated. So what was it about this that caused a worldwide um, protest that wasn't the case in, in other instances? And so I, just looking at what galvanizes opposition is uh, really, really um, interesting to me. And I think the, uh, the Danielle Fraser um, video of 
of that eight minutes, 48 seconds was, was the thing that did it. It wasn't the fact that, um, an African American man had died in police custody because, you know, that would have instigated anger, but it wouldn't, I don't think have had the effect that that uh, digital storytelling of seeing this happen so vividly in eight and a half minutes um, and then have that to be transmitted across the world. That seems to me to be the, the galvanizing factor here. And, um, and, and, and so as I was, you know, the books and the and things I'm interested in are, are not just how do we analyze this, these events and, and this ideology and so on and our identities, but what do we do with it and how do we take it forward? Because the only reason for doing work to me seems to be to have some effect in the world. Um, and so I'm just very interested now in the power of narrative, uh, digital narrative, um, as well as um, oral narratives or written narratives. And the person I'm writing the book with um, on creating uh, an anti-racist white identity, uh, my colleague Mary Hess, H-E-S-S, she has done a lot of great work on digital storytelling and has a great website with all kinds of resources, digital st storytelling in anti-racist work. So that really got me um, interested in, in the power of videography and how uh, those uh, now it's like everybody has a, essentially a portable film studio in their pocket and it has just opened up a window into practices that were distorted and managed and, you know, the, the narrative was manipulated and so on. Now you see the actual raw narrative and, and, um, and a lot of commentators have made the point that when whites see such a clear and brutal miscarriage, um, that's what galvanizes white support. That's what really inspires people to, to go out on the streets and, and as with the Minneapolis city council to vote to uh, defund the, uh, the, the police department. So I think if I were rewriting it again, I'd be more on on, on that dynamic, the, the dynamic of, of um, digital storytelling um, as a tool of uh, activism, a galvanizing tool that you can use. So I do feel, because um, part of my, also my interest is in leadership. And I've also been very, always been very interested in, in how leaders use narratives, either true ones, or I guess all narratives are untrue in, to some degree or another. Um, and I use narratives and my narratives often cast myself as the hero with a degree of omniscience that I'm sure I didn't really have. So I've always been interested in how leaders use narratives to galvanize some kind of social movement. And I first noticed it with Reagan back in the 80s, very consciously doing this. And since then, it seems like every politician has tried to do it in some way or another. They'll start a campaign event by talking about a particular person who wrote them a letter and they'll personalize it and they'll tell the story of that citizen as a way of um, galvanizing interest in a particular issue or policy change that they're, they're um, suggesting. So, so that's one of the things I've, I've got very much into lately is, is the power of narrative modeling by, um, uh, all kinds of people. And, uh, in, in terms of institutional change, one of the things I've, I've tried to influence is the importance of, in a predominantly white institution, senior figures modeling their own public, um, grappling with racism and having that be an important act of leadership. Um, so you're integrating really the dynamic of modeling as a pedagogic dynamic, as a way to help people learn something new and difficult. Um, but you're also, you're bringing it to bear in terms of, uh, particularly white dealing with white supremacy. Cause I think that's really, um, I, I guess in my own little way, I'm trying to model what it feels and looks like 
and how you experience trying to grapple with this stuff and move past it and move past shame and guilt and all the other things that are associated with it and actually um, get a sense of who you are and what you can contribute and what your most appropriate um, role will be. Because one of the big mistakes I've noticed and stop me when I ramble, Garth, please. So uh, no, no, no. I'm 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 enjoying this. I'm scribbling notes madly. Okay. So so, so one of the things I've noticed a lot in multiracial um, gatherings where you're trying to build some sort of communication across um, racial difference is that the whites will often declare themselves to be allies and and ask people of color, "How can I help? Uh, what can I do?" and um, and I think those are sort of um, mistakes that, that come with naivety and that you learn that, um, at least I always tell my white colleagues, never, ever say that you're an ally. Never do that. If, if a person of color says, I look to you for your assistance and I regard you as a, an accomplice or as an ally, then, then you know you wear that with a badge of honor, clearly with pride, but don't go in with that declaration. And don't ask people of color, how can I help? Try You will do it, but try to hold off as long as possible um, because they're so tired. This is what my colleagues tell me. We, you know, we're just so tired of, of hearing you come to awareness. We're tired of watching your wokeness. And uh, we, we want you to figure this stuff out. We've got enough to deal with just surviving so, you know, don't ask us also to be your educators. Don't ask us to give you, um, who is it? I can't remember the name. Someone wrote an article I really liked called The Good White Medal, awarding the Good White Medal. And so don't ask colleagues of color to give you the Good White Medal and to, you know, lay their hands on you and absolve you of all uh, racial guilt that you've had. Um, so uh, I, anyway, please interrupt. Well, oh my goodness. I I know that the listeners and myself who feel a little bit uh, ill-equipped for uh, what is going on to deal with it in our own personal lives, let alone our classrooms and our institutions, this is, uh, for me, this is this is gold uh, just to hear you talk about some of this, uh, some of these things from your experiences, because w- what I feel is lacking right now uh, for those of us who want to do good uh, and don't really know how to proceed. Um, we do need some hard and <laughs> some hard rules just to, to follow um, some, some things that would um, actually help the cause and not hurt the cause. Cause I think so many times uh that's how I personally feel is, um, it, I mean, things are not intuitive. It's, it's shocking, right? Lots of white people are hearing this and saying, well, I've declared myself an ally out on Facebook somewhere. Yeah. I wish I could take that back right now. Yeah. Well, you know, um, a friend of mine, uh, Lucia Paulowski, um, she, she told me there's two ways to do anti-racist work. One is badly and the other is not at all. So basically, <laughs> you're, 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 if you go in with, into it thinking, uh, I want to do it the right way, you know, epistemologically, it's a wrong way to, to think about the whole thing because you're just going to uh, constantly feel like you've misunderstood the dynamics, I think, of what you're dealing with. At least I feel that all the time. I, I, I leave every event and I do you know, workshops or something probably every week, even though I'm formally retired, I, I do something on this with some group. And I always leave feeling, oh, man, I wish I could have, you know, re- rewind the videotape and, and, and think through that a bit more clearly. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that um, part of, uh, if, if we want to get into epistemology, part of the white Eurocentric epistemology is the idea of honing and refining until we achieve perfection. And a lot of us are brought up with this idea, myself included, that if you just practice hard enough, it's the kind of uh, Malcolm Gladwell of 15,000 hours, 10,000 hours. You just practice enough, you get really good at it, at it and uh, the problems will kind of fade away and you'll clearly become expert. And I don't feel that's what 
has happened in my case, I feel like I have a better understanding of the complexities. And because of the better understanding of the complexities, I know I'm going to screw it up, uh, you know, constantly. So I always tell when I'm working with colleagues who are kind of getting into this area, try and take that burden of perfectionism off them, of, of being a sort of exemplary um, anti-racist activist. And so one, one of the things in the book that I'm working on with Mary right now on, which is all about creating an anti-racist white identity, is that you have to let go of this notion of perfectionism. And you have to realize that the the, the inherently in the nature of the work is a feeling that you're, you're constantly failing, you're not doing enough. And, um, and that's just the nature of the beast. And, you know, I think when you realize that, it, to me, it makes it easier. I, I'm not, I'm very hard on myself as a person. I really bought into the myth of perfectionism very, very early on. And I always strive to be better as a teacher. And the whole notion of, you know, becoming a critically reflective teacher, the book that you mentioned, mentioned that your colleagues have been looking about. I mean, the, the core idea of that is that the more we're able to see our actions through multiple perspectives, and the more we're able to understand the assumptions behind our actions, the more grounded and accurate those actions will be. So that whole notion is based on the idea that, yes, you can improve and you can get better. Um, but I have to say with this work, I, I think the most that you can do is become maybe a little less flustered when things always screw up. That's the kind of learning curve for me anyway. I, I don't beat myself up now when things don't go the way that I want them to go. Well, and your book on teaching race is very practical. Yeah. Um, the, the contributors that, uh, that worked on this book with you really brought in, for those of us who are uh, college teacher educators or high school or whatever, um, they brought in, and, and you even talk about it, I think, in your first chapter as to uh, kind of ramping up, onboarding. We don't want to jump into the deep end right away. Here are the ways where you can start to do this um, in your classroom. And so I appreciate that you have given people uh, the opportunity to learn and make mistakes in, in low stakes ways uh, so that yeah. they can walk away without doing too much harm. Yeah, I mean... Um so um, a lot of institutions now are suddenly aware uh, of, particularly since um, George Floyd, um, of the need to address race. And so they're um, putting up all kinds of anti-racist initiatives and workshops and, and, and kind of community meetings, town hall meetings and so on. And um, I think sometimes they neglect the dynamics of learning about this. So they, they, they go uh, straight into it with the, um, and whites, they, they address it, and, you know, racism initially and white supremacy. And many of the whites in the audience feel, what the hell are you talking about? I'm not racist. How dare you say that about me? Don't, you don't, you know nothing about me. And they get, they get, they get very, very angry early on, and 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 that anger blocks any um, meaningful learning. So, what as an educator, um, I, I'm sure you found this in your own work. I, I feel like you, you have to create some sort of um, initial connecting point. You have to find out what the connecting point is, so that people will be willing to go deeper and deeper and deeper and feel that you can be trusted in leading them deeper and deeper into this. So, you know, this goes back to the theme of, of narrative disclosure and modeling. Um, I would never, ever do anything around racism without first doing a fairly extensive um, piece of narrative modeling, talking about the way white supremacy has come up with me in the last two or three days or the last week and the kind of microaggressions that I've committed and the, um, the things that I miss that, that others have brought to my attention. So you need to start off as the expert by saying um, racism is not a disease in which your soul is called into question. 
it's a learned ideology. Um, and so everybody has grown up with some degree of white supremacy in them. Um, and um, so, so what I have to do as your facilitator is just kick off by explaining what I mean and showing you how it has developed and how it manifests itself in me. So you're trying, I feel you have to sort of normalize racism in a, in a weird way, show that having racist inclinations and, and, and committing microaggressions and all the rest of it, it, it is not a sign of a fundamentally flawed soul, like I said. It's a very normal and expected thing. We've all caught this virus, if you like. Um, and then you can start, you know, by scaffolding it. Well, uh, you start getting people to look at maybe examples of racism that are like mini scenarios or case studies where um, it's not the participant's own behavior that's under scrutiny. It's the behavior of some kind of fictional characters. And the, the little case studies you give can be familiar to people. So it kind of looks, well, this could be my institution or my department, but it's not you in there. And then after you've done some of that scenario analysis work, then you kind of up the ante a little bit and you start getting people looking at some of their own actions uh, because now you've done some scaffolding where they understand that racism is a learned behavior. They've had the chance to examine how racism plays itself out in these fictional scenarios. So you've got that ground. Plus, hopefully, they've also built some trust in you as the leader or facilitator who, although um, you know it, this person is supposedly the expert, has also modeled how um, how they're caught in in, um, in in a racial frame themselves. So, so it is a gradual scaffolding. Um, the problem is that a lot of anti-racist work is a one-off workshop. So, you know, come in and, and, and I get asked to do this a lot, do this one-off thing. And, um, and I wouldn't refuse to do them. Uh, because I think as a, an educator, I've always been very pragmatic and thought, well, I'll take whatever opportunity I get. If it's only an hour or two hours, then I'll work with it, you know, do the best I can. But to really get into it, I think those fundamental dynamics of scaffolding, leading people into it, a lot of early modeling, a building of trust in the facilitator, those are all crucial dynamics. So the people in the teaching race book, just to finish off, sorry, Garth, is uh, they were people who I'd seen across the country who I knew personally doing this kind of thing and doing it really well. So I thought, instead of having a book which says we need to become more of race and we need to be woke, we, and there's, there's, you know, hundreds of books on that. I, I wanted my book to be examples, very practical examples of the different ways people had tried to do these things using, you know, different classroom activities. Well, I'm struck by the word you use expert. And I, like you, uh, tend to be a little perfectionistic. And so when I hear a word like expert, I hear perfect. And I, uh, and I want to just, uh, I think clarify, and I think this is what you're saying that expert does not mean you have it figured out. Expert means that you're willing to model, willing to scaffold, willing to reflect on, um, on your own experiences of, uh, white supremacy and racism, your, your own, um, your own, uh, insights into your own behavior and microaggressions and and that using that from uh, let's say in a classroom setting uh, in front of students can be a way that you can start to teach race yeah I, I absolutely think so I, I feel like that narrative approach is very very important and so if you come in with a curriculum about race but you abstract, the teacher's identity and history and experience from it. So we all read certain texts and we talk about the nature of 
uh, what are examples of racial microaggressions? What is racism? What is white supremacy? What is anti-blackness? You know, all, you can do all those things, but if if it doesn't have the um, the expertise of someone who has spent a lot of time struggling with this and understanding the difficult dynamics um, and some of the contradictions in it. So the expert, you know, that's what you need because the expertise, the only expertise that I have is time, really. I've, I've tried to do this for a long time and I may be a little more aware of some of its complexities so I think the contribution I can make to people bringing, beginning in this, this act, activity is to say, uh, well, here's, here's what's going to happen. Here's how you're going to experience it. So don't set yourself up, you know, for, for declaring yourself an ally. I don't think that you'll leave feeling, oh, we made real progress today. That's an unrealistic expectation. The only expectation of success is if people are still willing to talk um, that, that, then that means you're doing a fantastic job. If you haven't closed down the, the, the conversation completely, then you're doing a great job. But, you know, also saying at some points, people just need space and time not to talk, but just to sit with discomfort. So when things go completely silent in the classroom and everyone is just completely taken aback by something that's just happened, don't rush and don't say let's call a break or if there's anger expressed or if someone starts crying don't think oh fuck it i've lost oh sorry sorry don't oh you're fine okay don't think oh god i've lost control here because anger righteous anger deep emotion crying frustration are, are, are if you're really doing this seriously that's what's going to happen so I think the expertise I have is is kind of ex, ex, I mean, uh, ex, some experiential awareness of, of what typically might happen as you get into this and to tell people, don't think that if these things happen, you've lost the plot and you've got it wrong. Um, and I wish I had someone to tell me that. Um, I missed another white person telling me, you can expect this. And don't beat yourself up if this happens. Don't think you've lost control. Uh, you know, um, I, I, I could really have used that voice, you know, 20 years ago. Well, that's interesting uh, that you, you know, you, you bring up the fact that you're a white man, because I think that might be a question that uh, our listeners would have is how has it been being a white man who has written about these things for 20 years, uh, thinking about them for 30 years, uh, especially in today's day and age? Uh, what has your experience been like in speaking to this issue of uh, racism um, and uh, anti-racism? You know, it's it's sort of differential um, because depending on the audience, um, a, a lot of time, uh, you know, I get um, strong pushback and and people uh, saying um, enough with the white bashing. Like one of the things that I have in all my work is I, I keep a, a social media um, anonymous back channel chat going. It's called backchannelchat.com. It's a great little tool. I advise anyone who doesn't know about it to think about using it. I use it online. I use it also in um, in face-to-face settings. So Back Channel Chat um, allows people to post anonymously their responses to an event as it's happening. You give them access to this web page. Everybody can see what everyone else has posted. So I'm doing my stuff, my, my thing, and, and a lot of stuff comes up on the back channel chat feed um, complaining that, you know, uh, of, of kind of left-wing political indoctrination, seeing race where it doesn't exist. Um, why, as I said earlier, why are you white bashing? And um, so I can, I, I can expect that and, and, and deal with this. Actually, this is not really answering your question, is it? What I was going to say is that, the experience of it is you get a lot of pushback. And um, I, I have this fatal flaw as a teacher is that I like to be liked and I like my students to give me good evaluations. So it's taken me a while to become comfortable with understanding this 
the, the dynamic of learning around white supremacy is that people are not going to say, oh, man, this was a great session. I've never thought about this properly before. This was really transformative. It's one of the most significant events ever in my adult life. I love how you facilitated it. You know, I would love that to happen, but it, it, it very rarely does. So, um, so I think uh, the experience for me has been partly learning to um, – to recognize, like you, my own perfectionism and to realize that that is a trick, to realize the kind of false promise that perfectionist perfectionism represents and its epistemological inaccuracy. Um, and then, you know, whenever anything um, kind of uh, really upsetting, I, I, I've had lots of institutional run-ins over this. I, I always say to myself, well, you know, uh, this is nothing. For me, nothing to what my colleagues of color have to deal with every day. You know, I'm uh, I, I'm so privileged, and and uh, so you know, enough enough with the uh, the this is difficult stuff. And the other thing, quite honestly, Garth, is that as a someone who's who's an adult educator and been interested in learning, you know, ever, ever since I was a young guy, um, the dynamics of learning about this are so fascinating. And the dynamics of, of leading and teaching about it are just so fascinatingly complex. I'm constantly trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And there's a part of me, I love that. I love that um, creative challenge of trying to think, how on, how do on earth do I work with a group where I know I'm going to get nothing but um, pushback? How do I try and establish some connection with them. Or lately, you know, a lot of my stuff, there, there is a, um, in settings I work, there is a, um, a minority of um, people of color, black indigenous people of color. And, and I'm thinking, you know, while I'm doing all this stuff on white supremacy, they, they all know this. So what are they getting from it? So trying to think through how do I make this of, um, of interest and utility to that group who are probably getting very weary of institutional initiatives around diversity. And so that's led me with my colleague, Brianna French, who's a, an African-American woman. We do a lot of things together and we've experimented now with racial affinity groups. So when we put people in small groups to discuss some of these questions, some of the time it's in mixed race, some of the time it's deliberately in racial affinity groups. And I would not have done that a few years ago. Um, that really, that's a new thing that I've realized is an important dynamic. So I think, you know, it's just really, really interesting, this, this whole problem. Right. Well, you mentioned institutions uh, a moment ago, and I, I was reading uh, Teaching Race and noticed that uh, first of all, if and correct me if I'm wrong, um, ra you say, I think, pretty explicitly that race is not an individual problem. It's a systems problem. It's an institutional yeah. um, problem. And um, and and you you really hold higher education. <laughs> At least that's what I was thinking about to the flame here for uh, doing these one off initiatives or for looking on the surface like they're doing something about white supremacy in the system and then not doing it. Um, maybe significantly. Could you just speak to that for a moment? Because I think that there's probably a few of us who'd, who'd want to hear you talk about that. Sure. Yes. Well, this actually also comes um, from my critical theory background. When I was about 18, 19, I read a little essay by Herbert Marcuse on uh, repressive tolerance. And repressive tolerance, just to kind of do great damage to Marcuse, essentially it's the the ways that institutions manage challenges to their legitimacy by appearing to make substantive changes and responding in good faith, but actually structurally very, very little changes. So there's a piece on my website, um, stephenbrookfield.com. Um, for, for listeners, if you're interested in following this up, my website is an open access, free download site. You don't need to ask my permission to use anything on it. So under the writings uh, link on my website, I have a, an article on 
repressive tolerance and the management of diversity, which really addresses this. So what, what, what I've noticed a lot is that um, it's bad public relations for hate crimes to be um, uh, noticed by the wider community, right? It does not look good uh, for institutions. So what they do is immediately think, well, we need, we need action here. We need to show the wider community we're doing something significant. So they will put out an anti-racist action plan. They'll have a lot of staff development workshops. They'll hire people to be, you know, uh, fellows to, to understand uh, and informal leaders in the institution. They'll appoint, um, a person of color to a newly created diversity and inclusion uh, or diversity equity and inclusion office. And so that there is a person of color in the senior leadership team. Um, they will change the brochures so that it, it looks like your student population is a rainbow coalition of, um, you know, different racial, um, uh, aff affinities and, and identities. Um, but what will not happen is that, um, the core curriculum is not changed significantly if there is a core curriculum. The standards for promotion and performance appraisal are not readjusted so that someone making um, a documented long-term effort to address racism gets disproportionately more merit than someone else. Um, and the, um, the, the person who is hired to the senior leadership team to be in charge of diversity and equity, because they have no support group there, after a couple of years, invariably they leave feeling demoralized and unsupported. And you see this happen over and over and over again. So to the outside world, it looks like a lot of significant things are happening. But the internal policies of the institution around promotion and tenure and appointment and performance appraisal, they don't fundamentally change. And the core curriculum does not fundamentally change. And those who are in senior leadership positions, presidents, provosts, or the trustees or boards of governors don't come out into the public light of day and model a sustained conversation on what white identity means for how they negotiate the world and how they see the world and how they structure the university. So without those things, um, you look good, but I don't think anything really happens. I'm, I'm sure some things happen. It's good to have workshops rather than not. And it's probably good to have a, a person of color in a senior leadership position. But even that is problematic because then the message is sent to the whole university that race is somehow a problem of color. So the person hired to sort of address it or fix it, as it were, is a person of color. So you entirely bypass this idea that actually the real problem with race is white supremacy. That's the problem. That's what you've got to address. And also in all these DE&I efforts, racism is hardly ever mentioned. It's all celebrating the difference and the dignity and what each person brings. But structural racism and white supremacy are, in my experience, conspicuously absent from this stuff. Um, so, so <laughs> can I can I jump in there because I yes, I know please. that uh, I know that there are folks like me. I'm I am uh, I feel very fortunate to be married to somebody who is very well read in many of these topics uh, for someone like me, who's lagging behind a little bit. Uh, I, I feel like even some of the terms are um, they're startling, like white, the, the, the term white supremacy is a startling yeah. term. I love how you deal with it. I just pulled it up here in your book, which uh, you, you define it here. You say that uh, white supremacy is a worldview sedimented in institutional practices to ensure that white people stay in control of the systems and structures that control our society. And then you go on to say you don't mean white nationalists, KKK, no. Aryan nation. Yeah. Um, and 
That is so helpful. Even as you're talking now about institutional change, that is such a helpful way to think about white supremacy. I wonder, um, do uh, are do you think that these? Um, I've, I've also heard other folks who are leaders um, kind of in this conversation talk about we need to be explicit when we're talking about racism. We talk about racism. We talk about white supremacy. White supremacy. Yeah. If you're talking about a particular people group that you're identifying. Uh, identify who that people group is be explicit about it um how how do people respond to you being so explicit with these terms um and maybe how do you deal with that you've mentioned a little bit about knowing your audience yeah yeah well i um uh this i think would would maybe differ to some degree with contexts um i think uh, if I were a teacher of color, I would be less able to use the term white supremacy um, with um, the ease that which I do, because I would then be seen as a person of color as being deliberate, deliberately inflammatory and I'm um, playing the race card and, and all the rest of it. But as a white person, I feel it's tactically strategically easier for me to use this term. And I choose to use this term because, man, it really makes people sit up. Um, you know, so uh, I, I don't talk, I hardly ever use the word diversity. Um, I will maybe use equity, try and reframe what equity is. Um, but I think the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion terms, uh, to me, have lost some of their power so I prefer to use racism and white supremacy also because that I, that's what's really going on. And unless we frame diversity and equity and inclusion within a framework of the perpetuation of racism and the way that the white supremacist worldview, I mean, because that's, that's what it is. It's a, it's a privileging of whiteness, uh, saying that whiteness is coterminous with human. So humanity is somehow has an inherently white identity and because of whites superior abilities to reason logic think critically take calm stay calm make good objective decisions which all comes within our inherently supposedly inherently superior intelligence that's what is keeping things the way that they are with this is so deeply embedded it's very, very difficult to, to uncover that. So I kind of want to shock people in a way um, by using the term. But um, I do realize that I have a racial advantage here. My whiteness allows me to use it. And people can't accuse me of, of playing the race card. And then when I'm working with a colleague of color, which I much prefer to do in this stuff, I really feel it's best done with a multiracial facilitation team. So whenever possible, I always um, w- work it that way. Then my, my colleague can talk about the problems of using white supremacy um, themselves and how their own racial identity um, affects the way that they're going to run the workshop and the difficulties they have with language. And so I think making a, um, uh, an explicit conversation about the dynamic between two facilitators of different racial backgrounds is a, a very necessary modeling for then how are we going to talk about it in our groups with each other? Um, I know I'm going off on a different tack here about the importance of multiracial team facilitation. Um, but yeah, it's all so, helpful. It's okay. all helpful. Okay. So thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, did you want to say anything else about that? Well, no, just that I've I've gone back and forth about thinking now is white supremacy getting in the way. So sometimes I will hold off on when I introduce that concept. But my inclination is to to introduce it early on um, through a lot of narrative disclosure. And, And so not just talk about white supremacy as the way that I've defined it in the book, but then to give a lot of very, very practical examples of how I have that perspective embedded within me, and I will never lose it. I know that it's always going to be there. Um, And how I see it play itself out 
um, in the way that, that institutions function and, and that, you know, departments and units function. It's interesting to see what's going on in our world right now, because I think what we've got is a this wave of explicit language that uh, that has come out of recent events. So yes. white supremacy uh, maybe is, well, I think it's still shocking to people, but I think it's less shocking today than it was a year ago. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- and- I think so. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, and well, I, and I just wanted to to say that we're all having to get used to this idea, and I hope it actually doesn't lose, yeah, um, the, its its shock value uh, through this. And you know, I guess maybe this is a uh, a larger question of when it comes to are how do I want to ask this? Are these terms safe in everybody's hands? And I know the answer is no, but. Um, I, I know that people are are doing their best uh, to, you know, express their understanding of these things, even, um, you know, in support of um, black uh, indigenous people of color. Their white folks are trying to do their best to understand this, but are could you do more harm than good without a without a good understanding of this? So I'm thinking about folks who um, are just firing off on Facebook, right? right. And there's lo- lots of broken relationships on Facebook right now uh, over these yeah. kinds of things. But um, h- how do you think people should engage with this the, this terminology? Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's a constant worry of mine, Garth. Is um, what are the possibilities that I'm doing more harm? than good because i do think i i've i've been in many situations where i've initiated some kind of conversation around race and essentially what it has allowed is for an even more uh, unabashed and apologetic expression of of bigotry and um and one of the things that Marcuse said in this, to go back to him, his little essay on repressive tolerance, he said that in higher education, he was writing this back in the early 60s, he said in higher education, we have this view that everybody is entitled to their experience and that everybody's experience is valid and you can't sort of deny the validity of everyone's experience. And I, I have really got caught in that trap myself because I do think it's personally that it's a trap to say, well, you know, that's your experience and it's wrong of me to talk you out of your experience and I honor your experience and I value everyone's experiences and everyone brings valuable experiences to the table, which is in adult education, that's a sort of, um, that's a credo, that's a, a mantra, you know, everybody brings valuable experiences. Um, you know, that's not true. A, a, a lot of experiences that people bring are of sustained bigotry and of and, and, and of having their, you know, confirmation bias around white supremacy. So I have to figure out a way, first of all, to keep people involved in a situation, in a conversation, but at the same time indicate that I think there are some serious flaws in people's experiences. And one of the ways that I will do that often is because I felt so much of this, my, this white supremacist inclinations myself, I can usually say reasonably convincingly, well, I remember when I used to think exactly like that. And then I had this conversation or then this thing happened. And I can use that as an example of how I was persuaded to open myself up to a a, a different way of thinking. So instead of my saying, I think you're wrong, I think that's an expression of um, racism, you're a racist, which I try never to do, I'll I'll use my own example as a way of of bringing people's awareness to that. Or I'll say, well, let's have, just step back for a second and let's look at how we learn ideas and particularly how we learn racism and how we learn white supremacy and some of the elements embedded in it. So, and then I'll maybe say, well, I think um, what you just said displays some of those learned elements of a white supremacist ideology um, that we were talking about earlier. So to, instead of saying you're racist or that's racist, frame it as um, this is a, a learned behavior, essentially. So in one way, um, 
I don't want to absolve them of responsibility and saying you're not responsible for your actions or your thoughts, but more to say, look where this has come from. This is a learning process, and it's something that with other things that we've learned, we can look critically at them and assess, are these accurate? Are they good guys for action? And, and so on and so forth. Because once you get into the you're racist or that's racist, people hear it as you're, they hear that's racist as you're racist. So, so I try to do those kinds of things, but of course I fail a lot of the time. And I've had students tell me, oh, well, it's clear. I can't say anything in this class because anything I say, you're going to accuse me of racism. So I'm just going to shut up. I'm not going to say anything else for the rest of the semester. I remember a white student um, saying that to me a while ago. And, and, and my thinking, um, on the one level, that's, that's a real shame because uh, that's not what I want to happen. But on another level, trying to say, well, maybe the discomfort that this person will have with um, their resolve to stay quiet will start to niggle away at them and they'll start to become a little bit more inquiring about why do I feel so strongly about this and what's really going on here? Um, because, you know, we need those elements of, of temporarily sometimes detaching from where we are and to let a period of discomfort sit with us while we try and make sense of it and resolve it. I don't know what psy psychology would call it, but it must be a very common thing. In, in I would assume in psychotherapy um, when, when, when people just have to sit with discomfort for a while and, and, and it's very uncomfortable, but in the long run, it's the impetus to some significant broadening of, of perspectives. Yes. And I have in my notes here that I wanted to ask you about discomfort because that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and the term in, in psychology could be something related to cognitive dissonance or something like that. But, yeah. uh, the, the discomfort, I, I want to talk about you as a teacher or a, a workshop leader. Um, can you just talk, if we are going to have these kinds of conversations in our personal lives or in our classrooms or our institutions, how do you deal with your, own emotions. I'm sure you have lots of experience with this. How do you deal with your own discomfort as somebody's crying, somebody's angry, somebody said something hateful and hurtful? Um, what? How do you not? Uh, because I, I imagine that if you go to a certain place, the learning is over, the conversation is over. Yeah, for the, for that moment, yes, yes, yes. And you know, sometimes you get to that place, and um. And, and although I define success by a willingness to continue the conversation, sometimes the point at which that conversation will pick up again is much further in the future than I would like uh, because people just need time to sit and mull over and make sense of an extremely discomforting event. And um, And my hope, as I said before, is that this will propel – some kind of um, productive niggling where they'll say, well, what the hell was really going on there? Why am I so angry? Mm. Um, so, um, but in, in terms of my dis discomfort, um, I think the, the, you know, the expertise, any expertise I have is with the experience of sitting with sustained discomfort and realizing that this is the norm. This is not an aberration. This is the norm that I should expect. So I really like the idea of um, Arawa, A-R-A-O, and Clemens, C-L-E-M-E-N-S. Uh, they wrote a piece on, on brave spaces. You may have come across this technology, Garth, that this idea of brave spaces rather than safe spaces. And brave spaces, um, my colleague Lucia Pulowski writes a chapter on this, actually, in the Teaching Race book, how she... <clears throat> excuse me, introduces brave space rather than safe space as an organizing principle for these difficult discussions. In brave spaces, your responsibility is to let people know what's coming. So you do your best to anticipate that this will be um, difficult and that people will feel emotional. And, uh, of course, it's very difficult in, in an anticipatory sense 
for people to experience these emotions before they actually really experience them. But you do your best to let them know that this is coming. And I personally like to use a lot of former student testimony. So I like when I'm beginning a new class or workshop, if I can have a couple of people on video uh, or even in the room say, you know, here's, here's how I felt when we were doing this. Here's what I've learned from it. Here's how I negotiated my way through it and have them give some sort of experiential preparation for new students. I always find that's very helpful because I think students trust other students more than they trust me as the teacher, particularly since I'm 71 now and, you know, I'm really old. So that's a whole other problem in and of itself. Um, so I use Monty Python jokes as if they'd just been made and my students have no idea what, you know, what I'm talking about. So, um, so well, that's, I think, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to cut you off there. Um, I, I, I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm thinking about this in, um, because right now we're talking about what most people who are listening to this will think through in terms of a classroom situation. Um, and I understand that uh, probably some of the courses that you teach um, are explicitly linked to these ideas. And then some of these, uh, the, the courses that you've taught, maybe leadership or something like that, um, that you, you need to find clever ways or maybe not so clever ways to infuse these things because really this uh, the curriculum is in, in some ways it, the the medium is the message and so the inst- whoever's doing the inst- instructing on it if they've done this work it will naturally sort sort of make its way into probably any curriculum but for those of us who haven't done all this personal work yet we might be kind of at the beginning of our journey towards understanding uh, uh, race. Uh, how do we take, how do I take a general psychology course, an introductory to psychology course and, and, um, I guess infuse it or recognize these things. Cause even in our, the history of psychology is very, very white mm-hmm. and very male. Yeah. Um, yeah. so do you have any suggestions about that? Well, I think, um, first of all, the current climate has made it a lot easier um, so I would imagine that when we actually get back on campus or, or when we're doing stuff in Zoom, um, you know, this fall, that there will be all kinds of institutional initiatives gone out to faculty acknowledging the current state of uh, the United States and, uh, and the importance of addressing uh, racism or the importance of diversity, equity and so on. So you already have a frame for this. And also most mission statements in my experience in higher ed, have something where it asks students to be better citizens or um, to, to be more critical in their thinking or, you know, develop compassion or whatever. So also I'm, I constantly tell new faculty, frame in your syllabus, take the mission statement and talk about how the syllabus is institutionally aligned, of course, institutions love this notion of institutional alignment, how the goals and objectives of your syllabus are aligned with the fundamental mission statement of the school that everybody is um, studying. So you do that first. And then um, I think you do the usual things. You, you, as you're talking about where knowledge has been constructed in any discipline, who have been the constructors of that knowledge, and, you know, it's not surprising, given the nature of white supremacy, that knowledge is, or legitimate knowledge, is pretty much coterminous with white produced knowledge. That's just the nature of the Euro- European Enlightenment, you know, that so many of us have been brought up in, myself included. So you just ac- acknowledge that. And then as you look at fundamental concepts, um, like the development of identity, you you look at identity, let's say, through a multiracial lens, and you look at all the Janet Helms's work on on white I- identity, uh, as well as it doesn't have just to be looking at um, models of identity um, drawn from scholars of of color. You can also it, looking at something like white white identity, um, you know, bring that in, um, and then I think. Uh, I would imagine most people go into psychology because 
uh, well, maybe they're required to take it as a mandatory intro course. But, you know, most psychologists are interested in human behavior and how people think and how people act. And um, human behavior in a multiracial world um, is going to be human behavior um, enacted across racial difference. And so now, as we're looking at human behavior, a fundamental problem, it seems to me, of human behavior is communication across racial identities. And so if you just, I mean, the students who are graduating are going to now, um, they're, 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 they know they're going to be dealing with this in whatever professions or careers that they go into. And, um, and some are resentful for it, about it, and some are very confused if they come from all white rural or, or urban communities uh, where this has not really been something that's been in their daily life. I think the fact that this is such uh, an issue of national importance, it makes it a lot easier. This is kind of where I started in my response. It makes it a lot easier to, to argue that as we're looking at the dynamics of human behavior, the development of personality and so on, this all has to be put in a context of um, eventually communicating across different worlds because uh, we, we have different worlds in the same classroom. I really liked William Perry many, many years ago talked about different worlds in the same classroom. And he was talking primarily about um, uh, the way people experience learning, the way they process information and so on. Um, but we do have different worlds in almost every situation now that we're in, different worlds structured by a different racial experience. And so just becoming aware of that is, you know, I, I, it would seem to me an overarching project of, of undergraduate education these days. Of course, I'm an old idealist who was brought up in the liberal education idea that, you know, um, we, <laughs> yes. we pursue education for the sake of knowledge and enlightenment. So I know it's a harder argument these days to make, but I do think that the way that you can kind of instrumentalize it is to say, look, any employer in the future is going to be looking for people who um, show some ability to be self-aware around race, to build good team relationships with people from very, very different backgrounds than their own. Um, and, and so you can frame this as, you know, part of a, of a vocationally oriented higher education as well. Cause I do think that's true. You know, this, this is, this is going to be the central focus for a lot of people for, for, you know, a long time. I really do think things have changed, uh, in, in some fundamental way feel more hopeful right now than I have for a long, long time with all the police, um, the, the deaths in police custody and police shootings and so on. Yes, yes. Well, thank you for that. It's very helpful uh, for instructors who uh, maybe don't teach a class specifically or explicitly related to race. Um, but there are opportunities to, uh, to infuse it, I think, uh, for instructors who are interested to do so. Um, so thanks for that. Hey, I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, I know that you uh, have a very, very busy schedule, um, but I want to thank you for joining us today. The Teaching Race book um, is extremely helpful, as we've talked about, um, very, very practical. And actually, at Cascadia College, we will uh, we will be planning to use it for a faculty book club uh, during the fall term. Uh, where we'll have discussions around that book. And I, th and, wow. and maybe, yeah, yeah. Well, and maybe if I could ask you, um, do you have any recommendations for how uh, that book could be used in that sort of way if anybody else was interested in, in doing it? Well, um, the overview first chapter, which I wrote, is a good place to start because that outlines the main themes that, um, methodologically seem to cross a lot of the different chapters. So you get things about, well, some of the themes we've talked about, the importance of modeling, of using uh, different kinds of narrative in teaching, um, of building some kind of community, 
of um, establishing a sense of what is to come the, through ground rules or brave space, um, however you choose to do that. So that's probably a good place to start. And then um, just kind of choose a chapter that maybe explores an approach that is new to you. Um, and in the preface, uh, I do give a kind of synopsis of each chapter. So that would be the place to to find that out. Well, I'll tell you what, our uh, our faculty members, or those who have read your uh, your books already, uh, really are loving what you're doing. So thank you for putting out such helpful content that really does help right. move us along, either, either in our reflective practice or in this new age of really coming to terms with uh, white supremacy and racism in higher education. And, and so I just want to th- sincerely thank you for, for putting this into our hands and for uh, doing the work so that we can follow behind. Well, that's great. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that, Garth. I mean, the the comment from a, a reader that um, I, I value the most is when someone says, I found this really helpful or I found it really useful because um, that's that's the impetus behind the books. I don't need them for status or tenure or anything like that. It's just basically, um, you know, I, I kind of w- when I um, – was a beginning teacher. And even now I really appreciate people putting out things that I think, okay, I can steal this and tweak that. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I do, uh, develop by stealing, uh, in an informed way. You know, I, I love to pick up good ideas from people and think, yeah, I could try that out with a little bit of tweaking. So, um, so I'm trying to pay it back, I guess. Well, that's fantastic. Is there is there anything that we missed that you would like to uh, talk about or um, uh, that, that we haven't addressed yet? And m- maybe you could tell us the name of your upcoming book uh, in, I think, next year as well again. Yes, um, it is called, uh, at least this is the title right now, Creating an Anti-Racist White Identity. So it's intended to be a very practical book that we hope will be used in uh, settings as varied as as colleges and schools through to um, uh, non-government organizations, healthcare, uh, churches, um, you know, just, just every organizational setting. And it specifically focuses on on what a an anti-racist white identity. So it's not a general book on anti-racism. It's specifically targeted at um, white readers because that was the gap that we felt um, what was out there right now. Very practical suggestions for groups trying to do this work, and for people also who are in the role of staff developers or um, leadership roles, trainers counselors and so on try, trying to work with others in this area so i appreciate the the plug for that it'll be out with stylus publishers uh, probably around march 2021 and my co-author is mary hess h-e-s-s so she has a great website um dealing with digital storytelling around race and uh, and again my website is just my name stephen brookfield all one word dot com and you can just plunder that and steal from it as uh, as you you wish again i want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today and uh i wish you well on your uh your quest to educate uh the public and uh, educators and systems about what's going on uh under the hood so to speak so i appreciate it all right thanks so much garth mm-hmm.